Hello and welcome to session 202 in the AISafety.com reading group. Tonight we will be discussing an article called On GBT3, Meta Learning, Scaling, Implications and Deep Theory by Gwern. Gwern Branwen is a freelance writer and researcher from America. He is the a, uh, a very, very prolific writer who has written uh, and experimented on uh, a very large number of topics. This particular article was, of course, um, published in May 2002, uh, quite soon after the release of DBT3, but it has been uh, continuously updated since then, meaning that uh, precise, the, the version that I'm using is the version that was current for like a week ago, um, so it's possible that there will be a thing in this, uh, if you come back to the article later, that I won't have covered for that reason. I should also say that Gwen Branwen, um, it's not his real name, he cares very much about his um, um, his privacy, and uh, uh, he is, however, um, very, uh, in the rationality sphere, the rationalist community, he is a very well-known figure, and he has... Um, um, he, he is taken uh, surprisingly seriously. He is not just a random pseudonym from 4chan or something like that. Okay, let's talk about the Generative Pre-trained Transformer 3. And of course we had the GPT-2 earlier, uh, surprising everybody by being able to both understand and generate natural language. And GPT-3 uh, is uh, the largest neural network ever. Um, and this would, under normal circumstances, be expected to have substantial diminishing returns. Uh, OpenAI in GPT-2, the GPT-2 paper, predicted that it would not have diminishing returns, and um, it, it, of course, turned out it did not. And not only did it not have uh, diminishing returns, but it was in a very, uh, it was qualitatively different. It was uh, doing some things that, uh, learning some ways to learn that the uh, original GPT-2 seemed to not have been able to. Um, uh, the uh, the history of uh, of the, of course the the idea is that uh, this extra compute that GPT-3 got compared to GPT-2 uh, enabled it to do some things. And uh, Gwen looks back at the history of uh, AI to to see how much compute has been able has have increased. This is following AI impacts, actually. We have the perceptron all the way back in the 60s, and there seems to be a uh, two-year doubling time roughly going on um, following uh, Moore's law until the uh, um, 2012. And from there, we see a 3.4 month doubling time. Um, finally, um, this is not from uh, AI impacts graph. This is what Gwen has added, uh, GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters. And I was actually a bit surprised that uh, Gwen put this uh, so low on the y-axis. I would have thought that it used substantially more compute, but here it seems like it uses less compute than AlphaGo Zero. I am confused about that, and I notice I am confused. So, um, the fact that compute just by itself brings improvement is uh, perhaps not very uh, uh, surprising, but the fact that it only provides that uh, Gwen has has this uh, mean, there are a number of means where uh, AlphaGo Lisa Doll, the uh, the version that beat Lisa Doll, um, did a lot of very interesting uh, domain specific things, uh, whereas AlphaGo Zero obtained basically the same, slightly worse performance by basically just stacking layers. Uh, doing something, um, not trying to do absolutely nothing smart and um, not even some of the, the things that look like they are easy wins. Um, they just p p gave it more compute and then performed much better. This is not an isolated case. We have a number of examples of other um, projects that seem to have uh, been, uh, improved massively through extra compute, in particular becoming more stable. Um, there is uh, all these examples and uh, 16 more examples of research projects which have improved substantially just by having more compute. Um, uh, I was not particularly uh, 
uh, impressed by just the listing of 23 separate projects that have this. Um, there seems to be no obvious methodology for how Gwern chose these 23 projects. There are quite a few AI projects. So just the, the fact that 23 of them have this uh, doesn't necessarily establish a paper. So here are some graphs for how GPT-3 in particular was scaled. And as you can see, the uh, the loss, which is a, a good proxy for how well it actually performs, seems to scale extremely linearly with compute, dataset size, and the number of parameters. Um, and of course, they are very um, clean and they're not bending at all. On these charts here, GPT-3 compared to the previous state of the art is roughly uh, 1, 000, a factor of 1,000, which is uh, enough that this uh, general graph isn't just, um, uh, it's not just a fact of GPT-3, it's, uh, uh, it's a more general trend. Um, and the, uh, the conclusion Gwen takes from this is that simply made very large and trained in very large data sets with very large compute. That, that's the thing that we need to have uh, AI, um, at least to, to get stabilization. Um, and I feel there is a point here that these three things are, um, are correlated very tightly. With this, it seems like you, it's not enough to have much more compute. You also need to make, to get corresponding amounts of data and you need to increase your model size correspondingly. And uh, the description that, uh, or the characteristics that Gwen takes from these 23 examples are that, so, uh, that the problems vanish, and the models become more powerful, more generalizable, more human-like. There is indeed a blessing of scale that goes like this. For deep learning, everything gets better as it gets larger. And this is, again, a counterintuitive uh, result uh, in uh, many, uh, I, I, I've studied algorithmics where it's indeed true that small things are hard and large things are impossible. Um, get, build, building things larger, larger problems, uh, more data is a recipe for disaster in algorithmics, but, but clearly not in, uh, uh, in AI. And there is a pattern uh, according to how much uh, data uh, and compute you put into the models. At first you get stability where the uh, um, you don't get so uh, where you don't get so much randomness in your performance. You get generalization where the uh, um, the models are able to um, uh, generalize to other not other domains but other uh, yeah, subdomains you could say. Uh, and meta learning where the uh, uh, the models learn to learn. And this is um, this might be basis for. Uh, or um, evidence for the strong scaling hypothesis. Once we find a scalable architecture, we can simply train ever larger neural networks and ever more sophisticated behavior will emerge naturally as the easiest way to optimize for all tasks and data. So that's a really, really strong hypothesis. Um, part of the, uh, the evidence for this is also the, the human brain, which indeed seems like it's mostly a scaled up primate brain. And this is uh, what has been called the uh, bitter lesson um, that um, AI researchers in general try to use their own domain knowledge, their own ideas about uh, intelligence in order to make artificial intelligence, and that generally fails. The thing that works is to have general methods of Lewis computation, and this is by far the best. Uh, this is uh, the bitter lesson is Richard S. Sutton um, uh, with another meme here. Um, and this is uh, slowly entering uh, the conversation and um, it's, while, while it's not quite mainstream yet. There's another Matt Botvinnik here. He's uh, the, uh, uh, one of the research leaders at DeepMind making the claim that learning algorithms that find or instantiate other learning algorithms is a strong attractor in the space of possible learning algorithms. Meaning basically that if you... Um, if you build a strong uh, machine learning system, it will be able to do meta learning. So why? That's a big question. Why do these models transfer and generalize when they become large? 
And that's, of course, a, a heavily debated question. And uh, Guan has an answer, or a guess, rather, that uh, well, he points four things that could uh, be part of it. The first is that uh, we, we, we get some kind of um, um, compression or distillation of the models, which in particular the uh, AlphaGo uh, and Alpha Zero seem to have. We, uh, there's a lottery ticket hypothesis that say that um, if you have, in particular, if you have models that are not very strong, then sometimes you just get good performance because you happen to, uh, uh, the neural network happen to converge quickly by, by luck into something that learns really well. There are LIBEs in the neural networks and learned representations finally. Um, I thought about this a bit, uh, and uh, you might recall some of you from uh, Nick Bostrom's book Superintelligence, where he claims that the three things we need for AGI are uh, a, a way to deal with probability, a way to deal with learning, and a way to deal with concepts. And Stuart Russell, uh, in his book, uh, claims that we've basically nailed uh, probability. We know so much about probability that our algorithms basically handle that in a robust way. And learning is also something that we really, really understand. And if we look at some of these, in particular, learned representations, this looked like uh, a good attack on the problem of concepts, uh, which kind of seem, seems to imply that, um, as both Bostrom and Stuart Russell believe, uh, concepts is the big problem, and we are making real progress towards that, towards AGI. Um, the more uh, technical way this actually works in a neural network when you um, uh, uh, dig, dig into it, then even though it's one model, then it has some sub-models along these 175 trillion uh, billion parameters. Uh, and some of these correspond to sub-models. And it's likely that one of these sub-models will work well. And if you have a large number of sub-models, then some of them will work poorly, some of them will work well, and this um, uh, uh, is kind of the uh, the same structure as you see sometimes in ensemble methods in AI, and the way these average out is to something like Occam's razor, which is, uh, the original is that, you sh that entities shouldn't multiply beyond necessity, and that you should choose the, the simplest uh, uh, model that still fits, fits the data. Um, and if you ha don't have very much data, then Occam's razor will just point to basically the data or at least or perhaps some superficial features of that. Um, but if you make the problems really, really hard and uh, the, the data rich enough, then it is actually possible to force neural networks into uh, what Gwen calls true learning. Um, this is one of Gwen's points that we actually don't have a very solid uh, understanding on how neural networks learn and how we should train them. So meta learning, the thing that GPT-3 does, is learning more generic algorithms. Um, and we need to have a substantial amount of data and compute to avoid just learning data or some official things. Um, and the uh, analogy is that neural networks are lazy. They need hard problems in order to, to actually learn. Uh, otherwise, they'll just learn textual relationships and things like that. An example is learning arithmetic, right? You can learn that uh, by rote that 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 3 is 4, and 2 plus 3 is 5. Um, and if uh, this requires some amount of uh, mental effort. And um, it might be easier to learn 10,000 examples of arithmetic rather than figuring out how arithmetic actually works. But it is uh, there is a, a tipping point at some point. If you need to learn enough examples, then at some point it becomes simple to learn arithmetics. And in, the, in this case, the simplest model is just arithmetic. Um, I was not quite sure, I'm not quite sure I agree with this because it seems falsifiable in a rather straightforward way. Because you can basically if you say learning arithmetic is as complex as learning um, uh, 10,000 examples, well, it's not very difficult to just generate 10,000 examples. Uh, uh, like, here's one example. You just generate 10,000 of those and make a neural network on that and see if it learns 
uh, addition or if it just learns these examples. Um, and I don't know if anyone has actually done that. I would expect someone has done that and I would have expected it to fail. Um, so uh, I'm a bit confused again here, but um, I don't know if I want anyone have any actually done this. Let's talk about the relationship between compression and intelligence. This is a, a, a part of a comic by Ryan North called Dinosaur Comics. Um, I've taken this from Gwen's article and uh, cut off everything except the punchline here, where the Tyrannosaurus says, yeah, but that's more to being smart than knowing uh, compression schemes. And the Euteraptor says, no, there is not. And this is the secret of AI. And I think this, uh, I won't go into much detail about why this is true, but I'll just state flatly that it is true, that there is a deep fundamental uh, relationship between compression and intelligence, even though that sounds really, really strange. Um, uh, going comparison to a magic trick, you take some information theory and a benchmark for human performance, and then you take a lot of tasks uh, and show the AI how to encode these tasks as just sequence prediction, and then you get intelligence. And everything else about intelligence, everything else we know about intelligence is basically irrelevant. And that seems like a tall order. Um, and um, it, it is a priori very, um, very uh, un unlikely uh, uh, that GPT-3 that would be able to learn this much. Um, uh, and uh, that, that this is indeed a path to true intelligence. Uh, one of the things we have ab that, uh, about this uh, relationship between compression and intelligence is the hotter price, a price in AI for the, uh, the project that can compress uh, Wikipedia the best. And I think that would be an interesting thing to see how well would G something like GPT-3 be able to compress Wikipedia. It would need to be uh, amended someone before that's possible. Um, and I noticed also that the, there is some competition rules um, which basically state that you're only allowed to use very small models and you can't reduce very much compute. Um, so um, GPT-3 probably would not do very well on the hotter price because it is a very, very, very large model. Um, so it, it would fail. Um, and this actually uh, points towards the hotter price being um, uh, being uh, designed in a bad way. Because why precisely is it important that it's small if the key to intelligence is indeed that it, it needs to be very, very large? Okay. So uh, go and have a funny example for um, a model of how something like GPT-3 uh, learns. And this is an illustrative example. It's actually working on byte pair encodings rather than characters. But um, go and say they don't actually correspond to anything intuitively. So he's, he tries to use it as characters for just an, a standard recurrent neural network. And I'm... I'm adding here by, for myself some examples uh, for how this is. So let's start with a model that has learned absolutely nothing. In this case, the uh, loss level would be 8 bits per byte, 100% uh, loss because there is no learning. It has no idea about anything. And if you have a model that has been trained on precisely nothing, it might output something like this, basically just random characters. Um, but then as it learns, very, very, very quickly, it will learn that there are letters that are more frequent than others. Um, so it can get that getting down from, say, eight bits of byte uh, uh, to, to five bits of loss per byte. It happens extremely fast. It will start to make something that, of course, looks totally like gibberish, um, but looks more like something uh, a human could write. Um, a bit more of uh, training and it will learn that some words exist and some do not. It will add punctuation, get down to uh, three to four uh, bits of loss. Uh, it might say something like correct horse battery stable, which is closer to something a human could say. Um, it will learn that some words have associations. Um, it will learn to make sentences. Um, and... Um, 
go and have it in this particular order. I think it can also come in other orders. You might get uh, uh, sentences that are, have correct syntax, but uh, of course, no no syntax. This is an example of an, uh, a sentence with correct uh, syntax, but no semantics. And gradually, as the model trains, it will get better and better. It will start to balance parentheses uh, and um, e e these kind of things continue to lower the loss rate, which is below two bits per byte at this level. And it's it starts in order to uh, to get the loss rate down. It starts to get semantics, so it might be able to uh, uh, generate a text such as Jefferson was president after Washington, which uh, you know makes some amount of sense. Uh, it, 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 this is of course an example of a true sentence, um, uh, but but slowly it gets more and more human-like as the the loss level uh, decreases, and. Um, at some point, this is the GPT-3 uh, level, where the error rate, uh, it makes an, a, an error in the text every 10,000 characters, and it has an error rate around 1.1 bit per byte. Um, this is an example of a sentence that was generated by GPT-3, which uh, is uh, from a longer text, which looks really, really well. But we can go below 1.1 bit per byte. GPT-3 can't do that, but humans can do that. And when humans uh, write sentences, we go down to maybe uh, 0.7 bits per byte. Um, uh, so an AI like that would be able to uh, say things like, my name is Gwen Branwen. Um, so let's talk about the last 0.4 bytes. The uh, uh, Sorry, not bytes. I wrote bytes. I mean bits. The last 0.4 bits from the... Uh, Loss level of uh, 1.1 to 0 0.7. And what's in these 0 0.4? Well, that's basically everything that the model misses. Everything that distinguishes uh, human writing text from GPT-3 generating text is uh, represented by the uh, loss rate where humans are still 0 0.4 bits per byte better than the humans. Um, and that means that in order for GPT-3 to get down to 0 0.7, it needs to be able to reason very, very deeply about these kind of textual scenarios. Um, it might be things like causality or common sense reasoning. It might be something like with a physical world where um, a GPT-3 might say something like, if you put cheese in the, uh, in the fridge, it will melt, or if you put ice cream in the freezer, it will melt, or, and... In order to make correct sentences about that, the, the model needs to learn how does the physical world work. It needs to have perfect consistency. It can't have uh, start writing a, a play by Shakespeare and then someone who's dead suddenly um, uh, becomes alive. When it writes a text, it needs to build up towards a conclusion um, in the same way as a human would do it. It can't just have a non sequitur or just go off of tangents and things like that, in order to, uh, something that a human can write where humans, where we write a, a scene from a play where there are eight characters who are talking to each other and jogging for position in some kind of Machiavellian scheme or something like that. Um, this is something that humans can understand. And that's something we have in our 0 0.4 bits that we have the GPT-3 does not have right now. And that's what's required. And every time, Humans are able to write a FAQ uh, and a, a, a description or instruction, something with logic and abstraction. Everything that we can do are in these 0 0.4 bits. Once we get below 0 0.7, we get something that is indistinguishable from a human. We might indeed possibly get something better, but that's a bit further off. Uh, and this is interesting because we saw that uh, a... Uh, uh, an, AI, uh, an AI with a loss rate of 1.1 bits per byte had maybe an error every 10,000 characters or something like that. And that seems to imply that um, uh, uh, it's not very often that uh, the true human intelligence is actually needed. Like 9,999 9, times, um, what a human does and what uh, an AI does is actually just as good. It's, the, it's very few actions where we truly need to think long term um, in novel situations, rare choices, 
um, where we need to look forward for the rest of our life when we're signing up for life insurance, this kind of thing. Um, that's where humans have an advantage over AIs for now. And uh, this is, of course, something that's important for humans because uh, if, in theory, you can make a single bad decision and you could die from that, and, and that might indeed be why human brains, which are, from an evolutionary point of view, are very costly in energy, still are worthwhile because every once in a while we make a really good decision about not going into that cave, even though it is um, it looks comfortable, uh, and that is enough to give us an evolutionary advantage. Right. This is an, uh, a reactor uh, from um, um, from the Manhattan Project. You can see some of the stairs to see that this is indeed very, very large. And this is uh, what I chose to uh, illustrate the hardware and funding overhang. Uh, Brian calls everything a hardware overhang. I split that normally into a hardware overhang, funding overhang, algorithmic and data overhangs. So the rhetoric question that Gwen asks is, can machine learning afford to run projects which cost more than 0.1 milli Manhattan projects? Um, which is in very rough numbers what uh, GPT-3 costs. Uh, because we might um, see that um, GPT-3 probably costs millions of dollars in compute. Um, and that's actually very little compared to many other big research projects. We have the uh, ITER project trying to make fusion uh, and failing to make fusion at 5,000 times the budget. Um, and if we had been willing to put more money into this, then we could have done GPT-3 decades ago. Um, and Gwen makes some implications that he, we should expect GPT-4 to have between 100 and 1,000 times as much compute. Um, there are also algorithmic and data overhangs. There is a Bruce Schneier code, attacks only get better in the way that these algorithms will only get better and better uh, rapidly. I think the attack uh, is a very, um, uh, this, this kind of framing that the, uh, the AIs are making an attack on the, the difference between AIs and human. Uh, it's a rather aggressive framing. Uh, even when you're not talking about AICT at all. So what are the problems with uh, GPT-3? There are bad training data. There is enough training data to fit on a laptop, and there is nothing with video. There are um, no um, PDFs or um, PDFs as images and books and photos, no robotics with features, with uh, feedback from the real world. There are a lot of things that are not there. And the architecture, uh, it's really simple, and it's uh, there are a number of problems with it. It's um, there are no the the uh, uh, few short learners are language models are few short learners article does point out a number of ways this could be improved, and some of them doesn't have, actually seem so, to be very hard. In particular, there is no fine tuning, even though that would be a really easy way to improve dramatically. And all this, uh, the algorithms that we are using are probably not even necessary. We could probably have done precisely the same with recurrent neural networks, um, the algorithms from 20 years ago. Um, transformers are nice, but they seem to be mostly about efficiency. We could have done this a long time ago. People probably will want to build these kind of models. There are indeed very big additional incentives to, to do this maybe even to have done this 20 years ago, because it is both possible and useful to go to trillions of parameters. First is, of course, the, the, the scaling curves are not bending. Quarn um, uh, had predicted this would not be the case, but it is scaling. Um, and um, we, uh, when we had the, uh, uh, the GPT-3 paper, we looked at some of the um, uh, benchmarks to see how many, where, Roughly, some of them would fall. One of the uh, important one was the Vino Grant, um, which is which 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 uh, Gwen expects would fall around um, uh, ten trillion parameters. Um, this is an adversarial uh, um, an adversarial benchmark, one that has been chosen to be as hard as possible for computers, and it seems like it will um, be possible soon. Um, 
uh, there are many people, uh, uh, for instance, the um, State of AI just um, uh, released a, uh, 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 an article where they say they expect that we will get a 10 trillion parameters model uh, within 12 months. Um, so a lot of this will cost money. It might cost thousands of GPUs. It might cost between 10 and 100 million dollars. Um, and this is without algorithmic improvements, and there will be improvements. So what are the actual incentives to do this? Well, even if you just uh, have something like AlphaGo, which uh, played Go, then you used a huge amount of hardware to, um, to train the model and very little to actually run it. But you could run it 1,000 times in parallel if you wanted with the same amount of hardware. And that seems to, like it would have a, a huge effect on the strength. You could use this, um, you could, uh, when you have a model, it's often pos possible to distill it into a smaller model. Uh, you can have transfer learning to other domains once you have this. Um, once you have a big model, then you can, uh, your, your next model can be powered up using the old model. Uh, it, it doesn't have to start from scratch. There are some experience curve effects and uh, finally, uh, this can be used as a, as a baseline for further research. You can try to take away some features. You can try to compare it with different architectures to see what works and what does not work. So there are big incentives to actually do this. Um, go and have a nice analogy. We are the cyanobacteria of AI. We emit the cyanobacteria was uh, the first bacteria that emitted oxygen uh, as a byproduct. And in the same way, we has, uh, have as a byproduct a lot of structured data uh, that the AIs can learn from. Um, so the big question is, is there any way uh, that GPT-3 can, or a successor can become an AGI? Um, there is another example here, I won't go into it. Uh, there is a prediction here that uh, if we get uh, 100 to 1000 times more performance, we would have a loss less than one bit and no one really have any clue about what that would mean in practice. Go and have a, uh, an extrapolation of some of the curves, and that would imply that we will reach the human level in 2027 uh, at a cost roughly as the invasion of Iraq. Uh, Open AI, they estimate that it would cost 1 billion in 2038, eight, with some very, very conservative uh, assumptions, I would say. Um, I had a very naive model where I just assumed that Compute would increase, uh, would double every three months, and algorithms would double every three months, and that uh, put the human level in uh, 2022 or 23, which is, of course, an extremely optimistic model. But I think um, not completely impossible. Um, that's definitely a, an, an upper bound, um, but um, uh, well, it should be a lower bound, right? It, it can't. It probably. Uh, in order to get this uh, a loss level uh, following these curves, we can't. We would need some extra luck in order to go below 2022. So this seems like we are at the cusp of a revolution. Um, but Goins claims that this will not kickstart an arms race. Um, DeepMind and Google Brain are an example of people who should be taking this as a splitting method. They have the hardware and budgets, the people, to actually build a competitor to, to GPT-3, but they lack the vision, the conviction to actually do that. Uh, Google Brain focus very, very practically, uh, and um, DeepMind believes that fancy algorithms are required and focus very much on neurology, at least in Goins uh, belief, and some of the other players are just uninterested and irrelevant. The Chinese AI sector is interesting, but they have the Dutch disease in that the, uh, their talented AI people are all working on commerce and surveillance. And they are uh, too hidebound and deeply philosophically wrong to ever admit fault and try to overtake open AI until it's too late. Um, and this is uh, there is a, a neat quote here by Norbert Weiner. Uh, which, who said that the one secret concerning the atom, atomic bomb, which might have been kept, was that of the possibility of its construction. Meaning that the, uh, once 
OpenAI right now is showing to the world that it is indeed possible to get uh, uh, a strong natural model, uh, natural language models. Uh, you just have to use a lot of compute. Then this is open to everybody, and this should kick off an arms race. So, what are the counter um, uh, the counter arguments? Here is an old model of how natural language uh, would uh, perform, and this is something that Warren dislikes. Um, it seems, of course, everything can be framed as a text prediction language. We saw that earlier, but there are many. Uh, kind of algorithms that are universal in some sense, and that's, that in general doesn't impress people as much as it should. And it's of course also a priori possible that training something like QT3 would just require too much data uh, and the scaling would not be good, or you'd need some kind of new abstraction or something like that. Um, but it's also possible that it would require uh, a huge amount of, um, of compute. There is this uh, quote by Niels Bohr that you can't build a nuclear weapon without turning the entire United States into a factory. Like uh, it's this, is, this it seems like a counter argument, but it in fact it's not really a counter argument. So what has been the uh, reaction of the research community to this? Um, this seems to be evidence for the scaling hypothesis that scaling is the secret of AGI, and in the research community this is wildly unpopular. Uh, and uh, Gwen does not believe that this will kick off an arms race. Uh, notably, there have been uh, very little interest from researchers, um, and the, um, we don't really see much of this compared to how much we should. Um, that's, uh, of course, a bit surprising to someone like me who will live in a rationalist bubble, in uh, that, to me, GPT-3 was huge news, but many, many people did indeed not react. Uh, I should say that this might be changing. Um, this week, I saw in the, the TV there was a substantial feature about GPT-3. Also, in particular, the fact that it was speaking Danish seemed uh, the, the fact that it could just learn how to speak Danish was somewhat scary to people. Um, and uh, part of the reason might be that the standard natural language uh, benchmarks um, seem to not really uh, have anything like meta learning in them. So, so the standard benchmarks kind of miss this, um, and it won't have some very, very unkind word about the AI researchers. Believe that the fact that they don't, that they are unable to predict this, prove that they don't have a model of how AI progress happen, uh, and that they do not learn from falsified predictions. And all they care about is supporting the status quo, remaining respectable. He calls out Buila Buila. I needed to look that up. It's an expression used to convey waiting for a response when there is none. Um, he has more unkind words about the crit to say about the critics. The people who believed in deep learning uh, in 2001 were very, very few. They were called connectionists and were um, called deluded by the rest of the AI community. Quern was one. He uh, was skeptical and he uh, had to admit that he was wrong and the connectionists were right. These, uh, this, the AI community in general have a lot of authority, but there is no accountability about their predictions. And um, the projections that the connectionist um, agenda would fail were made by eminent, respectable, serious people. And going calls out all honor to the fanatics, shame and humiliation to the critics. In particular, one of the things that Gwen is angry about is that people are not really reflecting on this or saying, why did they predict wrong? A lot of the communication seems to be fatic, not trying to communicate things, but trying to uh, get, uh, evoke feelings uh, of confidence, etc. Um, the connectionist uh, agenda was such so unpopular that the... Uh, that the AI projects between 1960 and 1990 actually did not improve, in particular, possibly to a substantial extent, because they actually did not get more compute. From 1960 to 1990, you get got uh, AI projects had um, one uh, million instructions per second for their compute, and that was basically the same. No one thought to really give it more. Um, uh, even in 2012. The, the budget uh, for AlexNet, which started the deep learning revolution, was $500. So, 
So uh, a lot of these crit critics dim dismiss these uh, machine learning models, uh, the connectionist models, as just something. But but reducing AI to to just X is actually the key to our success in AI. Uh, there are some uh, here I won't go through. Um, and Brian, I finally have some questions for people who still assign near zero probability to AGI within the next few decades. The first question is why? And I think that's a fair question. Uh, it, it might be hard for people to put their intuitions into word. Um, the next question is, did you predict in writing capabilities like GPT-3? I think also this is a fair question and an important question, particularly if the person who is claiming this uh, brand themselves as an expert. Next third question is, is this how you expect AI failure to look in the decades beforehand? I don't understand this question, I'm not, I must say. What specific task, what specific number would convince you otherwise? Um, there are a number of well-known tests for AGI, like the coffee test, uh, etc. The Turing test most famously. How would the world look different than it does now if these crude prototype insect brain sized uh, uh, deep learning systems were not on a path to success? Uh, I think there might be a missing inversion in this. Uh, people will probably just answer there is no difference because it is this world where this is not on the path to success. That is all for today. Thank you and see you. Yeah.